My name is Lyle Franklin and welcome to a tour of TLS. During this presentation, we're going to cover what TLS is and why TLS is important to the security of your applications. We're going to discuss a lot of cryptographic concepts and algorithms that make up TLS. We'll then see step by step how those concepts are put into practice as we walk through the step by step protocol from start to finish. We'll cover some previous attacks and vulnerabilities that have taken place against TLS and how to mitigate them. And finally, we'll cover some tips and ways to avoid common mistakes when using TLS in your applications. So get comfortable. There's a ton of material to cover, and this is a very long video. So feel free to pause the video at any time, get a drink, stretch a little bit, and come back to the video when you're ready to continue. First off, what is TLS? The TLS specification says the TLS or Transport Layer Security Protocol provides communication security over the internet. And it turns out that the bulk of data that is sent or received over the internet is secured using TLS behind the scenes. So some examples of this, if you type a URL into your web browser that starts with HTTPS, you are using the HTTP protocol with TLS under the covers in order to encrypt that traffic. If you use a VPN server in order to connect into your work network from your home computer, most VPN protocols use TLS in order to encrypt that traffic as well. And even connecting to a database, most database connections, whether it's MySQL or Postgres, allow you to specify some security options that will opt into TLS in order to secure that connection from a machine to a database. So it's this nice security building block for all these higher level protocols that you use on a daily basis. One way of visualizing these layering of communication protocols is the OSI model or Open Systems Interconnection model. This is just a conceptual model for describing how communication protocols relate to each other. So at the very bottom of the model is the physical and data link layers. And an example of this might be the ethernet protocol. So these protocols are very concerned with the physical world and how do you transmit a stream of bytes uh, from one machine to another over some sort of a wire. Maybe it's an ethernet wire or maybe it's a coaxial cable that goes down the street from your apartment. Above that, we have the network protocol or the network layer. And an example of this would be the internet protocol or the IP protocol. So this would be concerned with if you have a network of machines and one machine needs to send a message to another machine, how does, all, how does the packet get correctly routed to the destination mach machine? So an IP address is an example of where this protocol comes into play. Above that, we have the session and transport layers. And I would say the TCP protocol is an example of this, where this protocol is responsible for you know, retransmitting packets if they get lost or making sure they arrive in the right order, in general setting up a long-lived connection. And above that, we have the presentation layer. And this is where TLS comes into play. Uh, so this is adding uh, security to all those layers that come below. So we can see here TLS is built on top of TCP. So each TLS message you send will be wrapped in a TCP message, but it'll uh, add some security to that to make sure our applications are secure. And finally, at the top, you'll have the application layer, which might be your app. Maybe it's your app is serving a web server that's speaking HTTPS. When you make that HTTPS call under the covers, you that protocol would be using a TLS under the covers to provide the security layer. We see this like a mini, you know, this communication model is kind of like a delicious cake with lots of layers, each building on top of the ones below. And what we're going to dive into is the TLS layer, which in itself also has all these little layers and algorithms building on top of each other that we're going to get dig into. The spec continues, the protocol allows client server applications to communicate in a way that is designed to prevent eavesdropping, tampering, or message forgery. So we'll dig into what each one of those means in a second. Oh, and a quick uh, terminology note, you'll often see the, the acronyms TLS and SSL used somewhat interchangeably. SSL was actually the precursor to TLS, so we had SSL 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. The replacement for SSL 3.0 was TLS 1.0, and we're now up to TLS 1.1. 1.2 is kind of the current standard, and TLS 1.3 was just finalized in August uh, 2018. So you should be seeing that coming used more frequently in the near future. So anytime you see in a documentation somebody says SSL, 
they probably mean TLS because SSL has been deprecated for several years now. To draw a simplified picture of communication on the internet, we have uh, client Claire over on the left and server Steve over on the right. We, Claire says, hey, can you please show me some pictures of cats? The server says, oh, sure. Sends back a response containing some cat pictures. This is a very simplified model of how communication on the internet works. A more uh, realistic view is something like this, where the client says, please send this request to IP address 172.217. This packet is routed across this large network of machines out on the internet until it finally gets to the server. The server then says, send this response back to the client's IP address. Maybe that packet is routed across a totally different set of machines. A way to visualize this is with the traceroute command on your laptop. So if you did traceroute buzzfeed.com to get your cat pictures, we see that that request actually touched 14 different machines before it got to the destination server. You may be an optimist and think, oh, each one of these machines out on the internet is operated by you know, a nice friendly person that just wants to get my message where it needs to go. But unfortunately, any one of these machines could have been compromised or operated by an attacker that wants to read your message or modify its contents or anything like that. And if you're just looking at cat pictures, maybe you know, you're not that concerned about this, but if you're visiting your bank's website and you're sending your bank password out over the internet, I would bet that you wouldn't want to write down your bank password on a piece of paper and hand it out to 14 different strangers. So we need some bit of security to make sure that our message can't be modified or read on its way to the destination. And that's where TLS comes in. So what does TLS provide? It gives us confidentiality. So this was that eavesdropping example where we don't want uh, an attacker to be able to read our message. We want it to be only readable by the person that sent it and by the uh, intended receiver of that message. TLS gives us integrity, meaning we, the, an attacker in the middle can't modify that message without the client or the server knowing about it and raising an error. And finally, authentication, so that we can trust that the we are talking to the server that we're expecting to talk to and not just someone trying to impersonate that server. At a very high level, we have client Claire over on the left, server on the right, and in the middle we have attacker Alex, and they're acting as a man in the middle. Um, you'll see this phrase where it's uh, someone sitting on the network between you and the server, and they can intercept all the, your messages, so you need to build up a protocol such that they can't read that message or modify it. So the goal of this whole presentation is describing a protocol where Claire and Steve can securely communicate without Alex reading or modifying that message. Uh, another way to phrase this is a private conversation held in public. So you want to be able to privately communicate between Claire and Steve, even though the machines that are forwarding that are just kind of publicly owned machines that could be run by anyone. Let's dig into how TLS works. Uh, we're going to start small rather than just jump into the step-by-step. -step, a lot of these algorithms build on top of each other. So we're going to try to start with the simpler algorithms that make the most intuitive sense and kind of start layering them on top of each other to build up to the whole picture. We're going to start with symmetric encryption as it's maybe the most intuitive encryption example. In this example, uh, our client is, has a secret key that they have access to. They're going to use that to encrypt the message they want to send. The attacker is able to intercept the message, but because they don't have that secret key, they're not able to decrypt that message and read it. The server then gets the message, and they also have a copy of that same key. They can use that to decrypt the message and read it. Uh, so this is symmetric encryption, symmetric because each party has the same key, and that key is used for both encryption and decryption. Uh, the most popular algorithm for this right now is AES, or the Advanced Encryption Standard. It comes in several different flavors depending on the key size. So AES-128 uses a 128-bit key, 192 uses a 192-bit key, all the way up to 256, which uses a 256-bit key. In general, with all these encryption algorithms, smaller keys are going to be faster to compute. Larger keys are going to be more 
result in more secure algorithms. So if you were running that website where it just serves cat pictures, you may want to f favor really snappy response times, in which case you'll use a smaller key like AES-128. And if you're running a bank website, you would probably opt for the larger key size. Your site might be a bit lower, but it's going to be more secure if somebody tries to break into it. AES example, AES takes two pieces of information as input. It'll take your plain text message that you would like to encrypt and a secret key. For our purposes, it's just a random number right here. Based on the flavor you're using, the key will be of a given size. So in this case, we're using AES-128. So we'll have a 128-bit key. And we'll break our data up into 128-bit chunks. The first chunk would might be cats are really and then the second chunk might be the end of the message with padding added on to the end to make sure it adds up to an even 128 bits. This is a called a cipher block algorithm, and these algorithms tend to operate on fixed size blocks of data. So adding padding to get up to an even block size is pretty common in a lot of these algorithms. A word on the padding. In previous TLS implementations, it was just random values, but uh, newer versions use what's called PKCS7 padding, where each byte of the padding is set to the length of the padding. So to describe that again, uh, let's say you needed 11 bytes of padding. You would encode the number 11 in binary, and you would repeat that binary string 11 times. So this gives the padding a nice deterministic structure that can be verified by the client or the server. So to dig in a little deeper, so we have our secret key and our first plain text block as input. We're going to feed that into the AES algorithm. We're not going to go too deep into this. At a high level, the algorithm has a two by two array that holds its state. And it's going to do a lot of matrix operations to shuffle this data around. So it might do things like swapping rows around, swapping columns around, doing some bit shift or exclusive OR operations to really get those things jumbled up. And it'll do 10 rounds of this. Uh, different flavors of AES will do more rounds. And the output will look something like this. It'll look like just random nonsense as compared to the original plain text string. So that if an attacker sees this, there's there should be no realistic way where they can derive the plain text string from this jumbled data unless they have the secret key. So I mentioned exclusive OR. This is one of the workhorse operators of many cryptographic algorithms. So quick review for this. Exclusive OR, when given two input binary strings, it will output one if the strings are different at that position and zero if they are the same. So here we have our plain text and our secret key. We have a one and a zero in the first position. Those are different values, so we output a one. We have a one and a one in the second position. Those are the same value. We output a zero. Zero and zero is the same. We output a zero. Zero and one are different, so we output a one. And why is this so useful in so many different algorithms? Well, it is reversible, which is nice. So we can either take the plain text exclusive word with the secret key to get the ciphertext, or we can reverse it and take the uh, ciphertext exclusive word with the secret key to get back the plain text. So you can see where this would be useful in AES, where you have to do encryption on one end and decryption on the other. Similarly, it's difficult to reverse engineer, and you let's say you just have the ciphertext and you don't know the plain text or the secret key. It's very difficult to figure out what either of these input values are. So you know that if an exclusive OR is being used, that if there's a 1 in this position, that there's either a 0 and a 1 or a 1 and a 0 in the first position for the input values. So you just have a 50-50 chance of guessing. Same for the next position, you have a 50-50 chance, and so on and so on. And with key sizes as large as 128, the odds of guessing all of those correctly are just astronomically small. So you really need at least two out of these three values to be able to get the third value. AES at a high level, it has a couple nice properties for us. It is deterministic. So I described it as kind of a random shuffling because that's what the output looks like, but it's a deterministic shuffle. So given the same input value and the same secret key, uh, AES will always generate the same output uh, encrypted text and it's also reversible. 
So on the other end of the connection, it, the server needs to decrypt the message. They'll be able to run this in reverse with the same secret key and the ciphertext as input and uh, get the plain text value back out of it. But as we've described it here, it does have a problem. It is vulnerable to known plain text attacks. So what is a known plain text attack? We just mentioned that in exclusive or, you need to know two out of the three values in order to figure out the third. An attacker, they would know the ciphertext because that's what we're sending over the public internet to get to the server. So they know one bit of the information. So they need to know at least one of these other two bits of information to discover the third. This is called a known plain text attack. So we know it's gonna involve something where they're trying to guess this plain text value here in order to derive the secret. Let's say the attacker sees the first bit of ciphertext go across the wire and they don't know the plain text, but they have a hunch. They said, hmm, this is the first bit of encrypted text I've seen at the start of this connection. I bet they're visiting a web page and I bet the first block the first plain text block of the web page is an HTML start tag. In this example, if they guess correctly, they now know the encrypted ciphertext and they know the plain text block and they can start to uh, erode the security of the AES algorithm and try to discover the secret key. Uh, AES isn't as easy to reverse as the exclusive OR operator was, so it's not totally trivial, even if you know the plain text, to figure out the uh, secret key but it, it does erode the security of the algorithm. So to try to get around this known plain text attack, we're gonna use a construction called cipher block chaining on top of AES. In the original AES construction, we had our first plain text block. We fed that into the AES algorithm with our secret key, and we got our first encrypted cipher text block. We then took our second plain text block with its padding, fed that into AES with our secret key, got our second cipher text block, and this had the, this vulnerability because if we always start our messages with the same plain text block, we're always going to get the, first, the same first ciphertext block, which isn't ideal and can result in these plain text attacks. So what cipher block chaining does is, we'll just clear the slate here, it'll introduce this initialization vector as a sort of seed value. And this is just a randomly generated value that you'll generate for each message. Rather than feeding the plain text block in directly, you'll first exclusive or this first plain text block with the initialization vector, feed that into AES and get the first ciphertext block. You'll then take that first ciphertext block, exclusive or that with the second plain text block, feed that into AES and you'll get your second ciphertext block. And this has a nice benefit that as long as we randomly generate a new initialization vector each time, even if we feed the same plain text block at the first position over and over again, we're always going to get a new value here for the first ciphertext block. So this is a nice way to defeat that known plain text attack. AES seems pretty great. It gives us this ability to encrypt a message on one end and decrypt it on the other end. But there's a problem with this. And that is, how do you securely distribute these keys to all your clients and servers? This uh, encryption was very popular back during World War II, and the way they solved it back then was they would print out these large code books containing all the passwords for each day, and they would somehow securely ship those to their troops out in the field, and when the troops got a message from headquarters, they would look up the password for the day and be able to decrypt it that way. Uh, obviously, if you're running a website with millions of unique visitors every month, mailing a password to all your users is not really gonna fly. So we need some method to uh, distribute these keys to both our clients and servers. To solve this key exchange problem, we're gonna use uh, what's called an asymmetric encryption or public key encryption algorithm. And this was discovered uh, a little bit later in the 1970s. So with this, we still have a key for our client and a key for our server, but they're now different keys rather than the same. And each of these keys is called a key pair, meaning it's split into two halves. A public key, which is safe to share over the internet. It's totally fine to like have the attacker see that and send it across the wire. And a private key half that never leaves the server or the client. This is, must be kept secret and should never be transmitted off of that machine. As an early example of public key cryptography, we're going to look at the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm. The analogy I'm going to use to explain this is pe mixing paint colors together. 
really this uses math functions, which we're going to talk about in a second, but uh, the paint mixing is a good analogy. So the client starts by generating a secret color, blue in this case. The server will generate their own secret color, which is yellow, and they'll arrive on some shared common uh, public color. So maybe the client just picks the color red and sends that across to the server, and the attacker is able to see this as it travels across. The client then mixes their secret color with the public color to get this shade of purple. The server then mixes yellow with the common color red in order to get this orange color. Then the client will mix their secret color with that orange mixture they got from the server to arrive at this uh, specific shade of brown, which will be our shared secret value. The server will then mix their secret color with the purple mixture from the client to get that exact same shade of brown. So if you follow this through, you'll see that this brown color is equal parts blue, red, and yellow. So it's equal parts of the client uh, secret color, the server secret color, and the public color. If we look at the attacker in the middle, if they were to try to mix together purple and orange that they were able to see, the color, the resulting color would have twice as much red as it's supposed to, and it wouldn't be that exact same shade of brown. And for this analogy, it should be difficult to unmix these colors of paints. So you shouldn't be able to unmix the purple back into blue and red. Even though the attacker is able to see this red color, this purple color, and this orange color, they don't have enough information to generate this uh, unique color that the client and the server have arrived at. So to dig into the math a little bit, the common color is some big, very large prime number, something greater than 2 to the 2,000 and some. There's some very specific math about how to generate a safe prime number that's cryptographically secure here, but luckily the Diffie-Hellman spec just shares a prime number that's safe to use, and it's totally fine to just reuse that in your applications. It doesn't hurt the security of the, of the algorithm to reuse that number. The secret colors are just random numbers, and to do this mixing, to get the first mixture, the client could take two, raise it to the power of their uh, secret color, and then mod that with the large prime number. They send that mixture across. The server then takes that mixture, raises it to the power of their secret color, and mod that by the large prime number to get that final shared secret value. And then the client would just do the same thing in reverse, replacing little a with little b. So for a lot of these functions, I'm just going to, I'll be a little bit hand wavy on the math since there is a lot going on here. But for this one, this is literally all there is. This is a nice, you know, small, elegant little algorithm. Oh, and a quick reviewer on mod. The analogy here is kind of like the hands on a clock. If you did 29 mod 12, you would go around the clock once to get 12, twice to get 24, you'd have 5 as the remainder, so your answer is 5. I also don't know why these emoji clocks only have 8 <laughs> dots around the outside instead of 12, but uh, you know, I think you get the idea. And this is another one of those workhorse uh, components and a lot of cryptographic algorithms because it's very useful for operating on fixed size blocks of data. So for example, in the previous example, if you want to make sure that no, lump, no number gets larger than that large prime number, you can mod by the large prime number, and any value that goes over that will just wrap around at the start. So this makes it very easy to work with you know, fixed size blocks of data where you can throw some large math functions at it, and if it instead of overflowing, it just wraps back around at the front. We covered this Diffie-Hellman key exchange get a shared secret key, and then we could use AES in order to use that key to symmetrically encrypt our traffic. So it seems like we're already uh, pretty close to our goal of getting an encrypted traffic, but we don't have any authentication. So what does this mean? In this example, the way we've drawn it, we had the client on the left, the attacker in the middle, and the server on the right. But it could be that that server is actually just an imposter pretending to be the server we're trying to talk to. And we have no way of knowing whether it's the real server or somebody just pretending to be that server. So we need some form of authentication to know that we're talking to who we think we're talking to. The goal at high level here is we need some way for the client to ask, prove to me that you are server Steve and not some imposter. The server needs some ability to hand back an ID or some form of ID 
And in this example, it's got a little signature that says issued by uh, C.A. Charlie. And the client says, oh, we know who C.A. Charlie is. We ask them, oh, did you issue this ID card? They say, yes, I issued that ID. And since we trust Charlie, we trust that this is actually the rightful server Steve and not some imposter. We're going to dig in, we're going to try to build a construct that gives us this ID card mechanism. Before we can get to that, we're going to detour and talk about the RSA algorithm. I say detour because while it's related, it's initially going to seem like I'm not talking about anything that's related to this ID card business, but um, eventually it'll, it'll tie back into the main thread. RSA is named after the initials of its three inventors, and it is another public key encryption algorithm. So in this, we have a public key where the server has a public key that they're going to share across to the client and a private key that they're going to keep private. This public key with RSA acts like a mailbox of sorts. So you can encrypt something with the server's public key that it can only be decrypted if you have access to the private key. So what will happen is the server will send its public key across to the client. The client will encrypt their secret message with that server's public key. They'll send that encrypted message back to the server. The server can then use their private key to decrypt that message and read it. And since the attacker doesn't have access to the private key, they're not able to decrypt that message. But RSA has another trick up its sleeve. In that last example, we encrypted with the public key and decrypted with the private. You can also flip that around and encrypt with your private key and decrypt with your public key. So why would you want to do that? Uh, so this process is called signing. It's useful for proving that a message came from the server. So in this example, the server has some message that they want to prove came from them. They sign that or encrypt it with their private key. And then they send along their public key so that it can be read. So the client here gets the uh, signed message and the server's public key. They use that public key to decrypt the signature and they're able to read that message. They now know that that message definitely originated from the server. And it's not encryption per se, because the attacker could have also read this message, but it's a way of proving that a message came from a given source. And one of the building blocks of RSA, the math behind it, is this congruence modulo operator. So it's similar to the mod operator, but it's written with this three bar syntax. And the way you read this is A is congruent to B mod N. Oh, another way to write this out is that A mod N is equal to B mod N. We could say that 10 is congruent to 6 mod 4 because 10 mod 4 is equal to 2 and 6 mod 4 is equal to 2. So this, this operator is featured heavily in RSA. A little bit more of the math behind it. To encrypt your message, you would take your message, raise it to the power of your public key, the server's public key. We would say that the ciphertext is congruent to that value mod n. n in this case is another component of the public key. Basically the public key contains these two numbers, e and n. To decrypt it, we would flip that around and raise the ciphertext to the private key value, and we would con compute the congruence of that to get the plain text back out. For signing, we just reorder things slightly differently where we take the message we want to sign, raise that to the private key pow power to compute the congruence and get the signing value, and we would reverse it and use the public key to be able to read that back out. So at a high level, this is how the algorithm works. That said, there's a lot of more intense math that goes into how you pick good values for your public and private keys. If you want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit, you can look into uh, Euler's totient function, which is uh, use, uh, uses this symbol here, as well as some interesting math around large prime numbers and prime factorizations. So feel free to look at that on your own. In that example we just drew there, I did make a mistake. Did you just transmit that public key in the clear? Yes, I did. In this example, uh, the server generates this signature, which is fine, but then it sends along this its public key in order for the client to be able to decrypt it. And the problem with this is uh, the attacker can intercept this message, swap out this public key for its own public key, 
regenerate a new signature with its own uh, private key pair and then send that along to the client. So we didn't, we didn't put any protection around transmitting this public key. So unfortunately, this signing doesn't actually, constructed in this way, doesn't actually prove that the message came from the server. The problem we need to solve now is how do we get this public key securely transmitted to our client? And with that comes certificate authorities, or CAs. So certificate authority is a, you can think of them as a trusted individual. In practice, they tend to be corporations that are spread all around the world. And these CAs have their public keys pre-installed on your laptop. Web browsers like Firefox and Chrome will come pre-installed with a set of public keys, as well as um, the operating system itself, like Mac or Windows or Linux, will come pre-installed with a large set of CA public keys that just come pre-installed on your system. So in order to utilize that, we'll have what are called signed certificates. The server or the server's system administrator will ask the CA, can I have a certificate for catsarecool.com? The certificate authority will verify that the requester actually owns that domain. And if they do, they'll say, sure, here's a certificate signed with my private key. At a high level, this is the uh, how you get a signed certificate, and we'll dig into that more. If you're a server administrator and you want to get a new certificate from a CA, you'll generate a private key. You'll fill out a certificate signing request, which we'll look at in a second. You'll send that request to the CA. The CA will verify that you own that domain, and then they'll send you back a certificate file that, that you can then place on that server. A certificate signing request, you can generate one with this little open SSL command here. You can just paste this into your terminal. It'll prompt you for a bit of metadata, like what country, region, city you're in, what your business name is, your email address. It'll then ask you for the common name and subject alternative names, which we'll get to in a second. It'll then, at least with this command, it'll auto-generate a new private key, and it'll include the corresponding public key in that request as well. And then it'll automatically generate a signature with your public key by concatenating all these other fields together and then signing it with your private key. And this is just to prove to the CA that you own the private key that corresponds with that public key that's included in here. So the common name and the subject alternative names are the interesting bit here. The common name is the domain name of the server, which will use the certificate. So if your server is going to be reachable at the domain name catsarecool.com, your common name should contain that value. The SAN is a newer replacement for this common name field that allows certificates to be valid for multiple domains. So for example, uh, your server might be reachable at both catsarecool.com and www.catsarecool.com. If that were the case, you'd want to include both of those names in the SAN field of the certificate request. And SANs can also include IP addresses. Normally, you want to use a domain name to reach your server so that you can change it later on if you need to. But if for some reason you do need to talk to a machine with a static IP address, you can include IP addresses in the SAN field. And a little word of warning, a lot of docs will still tell you to put the common name in only, but a, some browsers now are, are, have deprecated this and are starting to ignore this field. So really you should be using SAN for everything to, and assume that the common name is just going to be ignored, but a lot of docs will still reference common name instead. If you were to go through this request, get a certificate file back from the certificate authority, it would look something like this, just kind of garbled nonsense that starts with begin certificate and ends with end certificate. To read this, you can use a command like this OpenSSL command here. It will show you that bit of metadata you entered, like the country, region, city. It'll show you the common name in the SAN. It'll show you the expiration date. So certificates might be valid for as short as like 90 days up to several years, depending on what certificate authority you're using. It'll contain your server's public key. And this key bit at the bottom, it'll contain a signature generated by the issuing CA. And this is the kind of the key security bit to this process. So if we look at the signature field in that certificate, we'll see SHA-256 with RSA encryption up at the top, followed by this random string of letters and numbers. We haven't talked about what SHA-256 means yet, but we know what RSA encryption is. So let's try to leverage that here. So the signature was generated by the CA signing it with their private key. 
let's look in our operating system for that CA's public key and we'll use that to decrypt that signature and the value we get back out is just more random letters and numbers so what's going on here so let's detour from our detour to talk about SHA algorithms so SHA stands for secure hash algorithms what a hash algorithm does it takes an input message so cats are really cool we feed it into the hash algorithm and out comes a string of letters and numbers that look something like this. It doesn't take a secret key unlike AES, it just takes an input message. What properties does this algorithm have that make it useful? It is deterministic, meaning that if you feed it the same input string, it'll always give you the same output string. There are no collisions, so given two different input strings, we should always get two different output strings. We should never have two input values that hash to the same output value. A good hash algorithm has what's called an avalanche effect, where if you change one character in the input string, on average about half of the output characters should change. So a very small change in the input results in a big change in the output. It is relatively quick. Again, sometimes more secure hashing algorithms might be a little slower, but yeah, this should be fairly quick to run. And the key part of a hash algorithm that differentiates it from the other encryption algorithms we looked at is this is a one-way algorithm. It is not reversible. If you have access to this output value here, there should be no way to generate, figure out what input value it came from, short of brute forcing all the possible combinations to figure out what the input value was. So there's no way even, like there's no secret key in order to decrypt this. It is a strictly a one-way function. These turn out to be super useful. Security researcher Bruce Schneider called these the workhorses of modern cryptography. They're used in dig digital signatures, which we'll look at in a second. You can use them to verify file integrity after download. So you can check that the file, after you downloaded it, the contents of that file hash to a known good hash checksum. You can use it to create file fingerprints for caching. You can use it to generate indexes on a hash table. You can use it to verify that a message is not modified that we'll check in a little bit. So the hashing algorithms are super, super useful in not just cryptography, but all of computer science. So the SHA algorithms are actually a family of algorithms that have been updated over the years. Uh, SHA-1 was introduced in 1995 and was used for quite a long time up until very recently. And in fact, there probably are some still some applications that are still using this. But it no longer satisfies this no collisions condition. A couple years ago, some folks from Google were able to throw a ton of compute power together and generate two PDF files that had different contents but resulted in the same SHA-1 hash output. So this algorithm was known to be insecure for several years before that, but that was kind of the final nail in the coffin. The attack from Google, I think they ended up throwing about $150,000 worth of compute power to generate just those two PDF files. So it's not a trivial attack, but if the attacker is well-funded, uh, this is no longer a secure algorithm. In 2001, SHA-2 came along to replace SHA-1, and this comes in several different flavors, including SHA-256 and SHA-512. The uh, 256 and 512 is the size of the hash output in bits. The smaller hash size would be faster com to compute, but the larger sizes would be more secure and harder to break. And so far, there's been no known collisions from this. And uh, even though it was created back in 2001, it seems to be holding up fairly well. SHA-3 was introduced in 2015. And originally it was planned to be a replacement for SHA-2, but since SHA-2 still seems to be holding up fairly well and there are no known vulnerabilities against it, it was kind of repositioned as a potential alternative for SHA-2 rather than a strict replacement. So in the event that SHA-2 is found to have some vulnerability, we'll have the SHA-3 algorithm on standby, uh, but for now most applications will use something in the SHA-2 family. Let's talk more about collisions, since that seemed to be like the main difference between these different families of algorithms. So uh, we're going to, to discuss collisions, we're going to be discussing the birthday problem. And the way this problem is framed is given n number of people in a room, what's the probability that some pair will have the same birthday? Or to word it slightly differently, how many people do we need in the room for a 50% chance of a birthday collision? To think this through, you might think, intuitively well there's uh 
for a given individual, their birthday has a one out of 365 chance on being on a given day of the year. So to get over 50%, would we need maybe 183 people in the room to just to get just over half the total number of birthdays? And this is one of those cases where intuition about the problem is pretty far off from what the actual math turns out to be. Although this is true for a given individual, so we have one individual, their birthday is on one of these 365 days, one other person walks into the room, there's now a one out of 365 chance that these two will have a birthday collision. Another person walks in the room, this is another one out of 365 chance of a birthday collision. But when this person walks in, they also have a chance to collide with this other person, the second person that walked in the room. And it turns out this is the part that this first intuitive pass was missing. As we keep adding more and more people, the number of edges grows faster and faster and faster at a factorial rate. So it turns out the actual math function to figure out this answer is listed here. And uh, if we do the math a little bit, it turns out we need just 23 people to get just over a 50% chance of a birthday collision. So let's take that, relate that back to our hash function here. So we have the birthday attack. Oh, very scary. So generating it because of this math behind the, these birthday collisions, generating a hash collision takes less than two to the output bits divided by two hash computations. So for example, if we're talking about the SHA-1 algorithm, it has 160-bit output. This would take uh, about, we know that an upper bound for the number of operations to break this is 2 to the 80, which is uh, around 10 to the 24 power, or a 1 and a 2 with 24 zeros after it. With 256, we have 256 bits output. This is 2 to the 128 operations, or 10 to the 38. And SHA-512 goes all the way up to 10 to the 77. Again, numbers like this kind of defy intuition a little bit. Like it's really hard to get a number, like to conceptualize a number this large. You might think, oh, well, yeah, this is a really big number. But if we throw enough computers at it, eventually we'll be able to generate that many operations and break it. Well, let's put these numbers in perspective a little bit. So number of seconds since the Big Bang is 10 to the 17. The number of operations you would need for a 1% chance of a SHA-256 collision is 10 to the 37. So even if you were doing thousands of computations since the beginning of the Big Bang, you still wouldn't be close to generating a SHA-256 collision. For a SHA-512 collision, it's around 10 to the 76, which is just shy of the estimated number of atoms in the universe. So these are just astronomically large numbers. So the way we avoid collisions is just by making the uh, possible uh, output space so large that you couldn't possibly hit another value. Let's dig into the internals of this algorithm. We'll again break our input up into chunks, each of 512 bits each. And this algorithm starts with an internal state. In the case of SHA-256, these are 32 bits each. If this was SHA-512, SHA this would double to 64 bits each. Oh, in these input chunks, uh, this isn't a typo. SHA-256 also uses 512 uh, input chunks. All the different SHA-2 algorithms have the same size input, but the output size will vary. As far as what we set the initial state, the internal state to initially, <laughs> the spec says the first 32 bits of the fractional parts of the square roots of the first eight prime numbers. So I've uh, drawn the hash algorithm as a little wizard here because this sounds like some sort of a magic spell. But uh, if you wanted to dive into the spec and dig into how they came to using these exact numbers, please do. Um, so that's going to be what we seed this initial state array with is these first 32 bits of the fractional parts. So we'll start by taking our first input chunk. We'll feed that in to the hash algorithm along with our initial state here. The hash algorithm wizard will say some other magic spells like x rotate 7, xor, x right rotate 18, that sort of thing. A lot of like very specific bit shifting operations going on. He'll then perform 64 rounds of that and the other types of SHA algorithms will do slightly more rounds. 
He'll then feed that output value back into the internal state array. We'll then feed our second input block in and we'll feed it this new internal state array. We'll shuffle that around 64 times to get another updated state. And finally, we'll feed our final block in, shuffle that around with this new state, and we'll get our final output state. We'll then take the state and concatenate each of these bits or each of these blocks together, and that'll give us our final hash digest. To pop the stack back to our CA example, we decrypted the signature in our certificate and we got this uh, random string of letters and numbers. We now know that this looks like a SHA-256 output. How did this come about? What the CA did was the CA said, hey, little hash algorithm, can you give me the SHA-256 of the country, the region, the city, the common name, the certificate's public key, all those fields that we passed in our signing or our certificate request, we'll concatenate all those together, and then we'll take the hash value of that. The, our little hash wizard will give us that back. The CA will then take this hash value, they'll sign that with their private key, and that'll be the signature value that's contained within our certificate. So this is the part that ensures, that proves to you that the certificate was issued by the CA. And if you decrypt this value with the CA's public key, you'll be able to check that the values within that match the values in the certificate. This proves that, yeah, Charlie the CA has verified that the holder of the private key corresponding to the public key contained within this certificate is the owner of catsarecool.com. So this is the signature part is what makes that ID card valid, if you will. Let's see how this works in practice. The client will start by sending a request to the server, says, hey, server, can you send me your certificate, please? The, certif the server says, yep, let me send you all these fields. The client will then perform a lot of uh, safety checks to make sure everything looks in order. So first they'll say, well, I was making a request to catsarecool.com. Is that string contained within the SANS field? If it is, we'll check that off. If it's not, we'll close the connection there and throw an error. We'll check that the uh, certificate hasn't expired yet. That looks good, we'll continue. We then get to this signature block. We'll see uh, within this that it was issued by, there'll be a bit of metadata that says issued by Charlie the CA. We'll look for Charlie's private key or public key, sorry, in our system. We'll then use Charlie's public key to read this signature. We'll then concatenate together all the other fields of the certificate and take the hash output from that. Uh, we'll then check that hash output against the hash output we just read out of the signature. If that looks good, we'll check that off. At this point, we believe the server is who they say they are. We then feel safe to encrypt our message we want to send with that server's public key. We'll then send that public key back across and the server will use their private key to decrypt that and read the message back out. Using RSA to give us this authentication that we needed to trust that the server is who they say they are. A little bit more to talk about with the certificate authorities. So far, uh, we've been talking about root CAs. So these are the certificate authorities that their key comes pre-installed on your laptop. But there's also what's called an intermediate CA. So what this means is a root certificate authority has uh, issued a C certificate with this CA. It's got a little flag in it that says CA true. They then use their private key to sign that certificate and they'll hand that to an intermediate CA. And what this is saying, the root CA is delegating some of that signing responsibility to this intermediate CA. So this says the holder of this uh, CA certificate and its private key are now able to also issue certificates as if they were the root CA. If the server down at the bottom here sends a certificate signing request, they can send it to the intermediate CA rather than sending it directly to the root CA. And we'll see what that looks like in a second. Oh, and then the, the intermediate CA could then do the signing and give a certificate to the server. So this built on the idea of what's called a chain of trust. So when you make a request to a server, the server hands you back the certificate, which contains a signature. 
If this is signed directly by a root CA, you could just use that uh, root CA's public key to read the signature and everything would be great. In this case, you would read this and see, hmm, this isn't issued by a CA that I know about or that's in my root CA directory. So the server will, as part of its sending back the certificate, it'll also concatenate the intermediate CA certificate onto its server certificate following it, then we'll be able to see this signature and we'll see, oh, this certificate is actually issued by a root CA that I have the public key for. Because I trust the root CA, meaning the, CA, the root CA's uh, public key is installed on my laptop, and the root CA has vouched for this intermediate CA, and the intermediate CA trusts the server, then we've built a chain of trust from the root CA down to the server, so we in fact trust the server. Uh, so this is what's known as a chain of trust and allows uh, intermediate CAs to function as if they were the root CAs. Next, let's talk about self-signed certificates. So these intermediate and root CAs are great for talking with uh, sites out on the internet, but if you're operating a data center, you still need secure communication between all those machines within the data center, and it's kind of a pain to go to the CA and request certificates for every one of those machines within the data center. So what you can do is you can act as your own CA and generate a CA certificate. This certificate won't be signed by a root CA, uh, which is why it's called self-signed, is you're kind of signing it for yourself. You'll then take, as a system administrator, you'll install that CA's public key on all the machines within your data center. Then you can act like a real CA and start issuing certificates to servers within that data center. And now if any one of these uh, machines needs to talk with the server within the data center, they'll have that CA's key pre-installed and they'll trust that the server is, um, yeah, they'll trust the connection to this server. So when you're operating machines within a data center or within your corporate network, uh, you'll often see these uh, self-signed certificates used. You may have noticed that all this whole TLS authentication security mechanism really hinges on these CAs doing the right thing and being responsible. Um, in this initial slide, I just drew four different CAs that come pre-installed on your laptop, where in reality, there are over, uh, there are just hundreds of CAs all around the world. Like on, when I checked my system, I think there were over 140 different CAs installed in my Linux laptop. And if any one of these root CAs maybe starts going rogue and issuing certificates they're not supposed to, or they leak their private key, uh, this totally erodes the whole authentication mechanism of TLS because that rogue CA can just start generating invalid certs for whoever they want. So this doesn't feel great. Um, what has kind of evolved out of this is browsers, so like Firefox pictured here, or Internet Explorer, or Chrome, they've kind of become the de facto sheriffs of the TLS authentication world to try to keep these certificate authorities in line. One way they've done this is with tr certificate transparency. So several browsers have now required that if a CA wants their public key pre-installed with Firefox, they need to publish what's called a certificate transparency record. So one way the browsers have helped enforce this is through certificate transparency requirements. So what this means is uh, a browser says to a CA, if you want your public key to come pre-installed with my browser, I need you to publish a record of every certificate you've ever issued. So this is called a certificate transparency record. So this will say something like, you know, I, Bob the CA, issued a certificate for this domain name at this date with this expiration, things like that. And browser manufacturers will periodically audit these lists, and if they see something they don't like, they might give a stern warning to that CA, and if this bad behavior continues, they might remove that CA's, they might push out an update that removes that CA's public key from their browser. So some stuff that might cause this is maybe a CA is generating certificates for host names that they don't have access to. Uh, so some CAs in the past have been caught generating test certificates for google.com. That's a big no-no. Google did not ask them to issue a certificate for that, and they shouldn't have been doing that, things of that nature. Certificate pinning is another way that was prescribed to help sort this out. When you're using certificate pinning, a server hands back its certificate and it includes a little header that says to the client, please pin this certificate. 
means on the first request, the client will get the certificate. They'll then record a copy of this certificate. And the next time they make a request to that site, they'll verify that the certificate matches the previous certificate that they had pinned. And there'll be some time expiration on that pinning process. So if a CA goes rogue, starts issuing certificates that they weren't supposed to, uh, let's say this attacker gets a new issues as false certificate, and tries to pass that off on the client, the client will say, nope, I've already pinned the old certificate. This one doesn't match. Uh, I'm going to not refuse this connection. So this was intended as a way to mitigate some of this mistakes by CAs. But certificate pinning comes with problems of its own. So let's say the server accidentally leaks its public key and needs to rotate its certificate. Once it starts handing out that new certificate, clients will start refusing it because they had the old certificate pinned. Honestly, this caused more problems than it helped and some browsers like Chrome have since deprecated this certificate pinning feature. We'll talk about other ways to mitigate that coming up. Leaking your private key is another thing that can happen. So this is the server having its private key compromised. So let's say an attacker was able to get access to the server, it was able to grab a copy of that private key. Uh, what would happen here is this attacker could pretend to be the server, they could return the server certificate to the client, the client would do all the little checks, says, oh, everything looks in order. They'd send that back to the attacker. The attacker could then use this private key to decrypt that message. Um, so how do we prevent this, or how do we help mitigate this? There's a thing called a Certificate Revocation List, or CRL. Uh, and this is a list that's maintained by the CA that is a list of all the certificates that have been revoked. So if a system administrator knows that their uh, server's key has been compromised, they can inform the CA. The CA will add that certificate to the revocation list and issue a new certificate to that user. Uh, one way this could be used is when a, a client, like a browser, could periodically fetch this uh, revocation list from the CA, and the CA would sign this to make sure it was protected with their public key, the client could then read that signature, check if the certificate they just fetched from a website is on the revocation list. If so, they're not going to trust it. So this ensures that if a certificate is revoked, the client finds out about it in a timely way and is able to stop from visiting sites that have uh, revoked certificates. Uh, there's kind of a problem with this, though, in that this certificate revocation list could be just thousands and thousands of entries long. So this is a lot of data to be fetching back from the CA. Uh, so what we'll look at, oh, and they'll read the signature. So a slight improvement on this is the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. Uh, rather than the client fetching the entire revocation list back from the server, or back from the CA, they'll instead just pass that individual uh, server's certificate to the certificate authority and say, hey, can you please check your revocation list to see if this certificate has been revoked? And the CA will either send back a signed response that says, yep, doesn't appear on my list, looks great, you should continue with the connection. They'll send it back a response that says, no, this certificate has been revoked, please bail out of the connection. Or they'll just send back a, I don't know, like maybe I didn't issue this CA, you should ask somebody else, something like that. So this is an improvement. It cut rather than passing the whole revocation list back and forth, you're just passing that individual server's certificate. But this still puts a lot of burden on the client to at the start of every connection to keep making this request to the certificate authority. And this would put a ton of load on the certificate authority's website where every client in the world is just hammering these CA sites, trying to get the figure out whether these certificates are valid or not. So this isn't ideal either. There's also the case where, what if this request fails? For example, a request, the OCSP request, gets lost on the way to the CA, maybe the CA, CA's website times out or just isn't available at that time. As a browser manufacturer, what should you do in this situation? Should you opt for just showing the website anyway, favoring really snappy response times and fast page loads, or do you opt for the more secure solution, which is just don't serve the page, throw a security error and a big warning that says, hey, I couldn't verify whether this certificate was revoked or not. Security often involves these user experience versus security trade-offs. And in this specific example, uh, most brand browser manufacturers decided that if the request fails, just show the web page anyway. Just assume it probably would have been fine and favor snappier page loads times. 
So yeah, this is this obviously is an ideal. An evolution of this is OCSP stapling. So what this means is when a server is initially issued a certificate, they can opt into this must staple feature where the certificate is issued with a field that says must staple. And rather than the client being responsible for hitting the CA and figuring out whether a certificate is revoked, the server that holds the certificate, before they send the certificate to the client, they'll send the, their certificate to the CA, have the CA perform the revocation check. The CA will then include a little signature in their response that says, that's timestamped that says the server checked in with me and this certificate is still valid and you should trust it up to this expiration time that's included within the signature. They'll send that back to the server. The server then can cache this certificate with the little staple value up to close to that expiration time. Then when a client requests that certificate, they send that over and the client can first, they'll uh, read the certificate, they'll see this must staple header, they'll then use the CA's public key to verify that this staple value is correct and hasn't hit its expiration date yet. If the client were to receive a certificate with this must staple header that didn't have this value stapled on it, the browser would raise an error. So this is a, a nice pattern that you could think about in your server. There's still the issue that if the CA's website is down for a longer length of time, it could technically, you know, it could take down your website because you're not able to get that stapled value from the CA's website. Uh, but this is the nicest pattern out of these ones we've discussed. So with that, we, this is a we've covered a lot of information so far. Uh, this is probably a good time to take a break, stretch, uh, you know, pause the video and get a glass of water. Um, let this stuff digest for a little bit and I'll see you in a few minutes. And we're back. It seems like RSA can do everything we need in this TLS conversation. It can do encryption, it can do signing, which in turn gives us a way to do authentication with certificate authorities. It seems like we could just use RSA throughout and we would have all the building blocks we need to form this TLS conversation. Problem is, RSA is really slow, so it's really only suitable for encrypting small amounts of data. The math is just so computationally intensive that if you try to encrypt and use this to encrypt the entire TLS conversation, performance would just be terrible. So what we need is some form of quick encryption, but also these nice authentication uh, properties that RSA gives us. So to do that, we can merge our, maybe combine our slow RSA algorithm to get that authentication property, but our quick little AES algorithm to do the bulk of the encryption. And it turns out AES is about 100 times faster, several orders of magnitude, than RSA. And that's pretty common with symmetric versus asymmetric algorithms. Symmetric algorithms tend to be much, much faster. So to try to get this best of both worlds, we're not going to use RSA to encrypt our entire conversation. We're just going to use RSA to encrypt a randomly generated symmetric key for use with AES encryption. So let's see what that looks like. So the client starts by sending a certificate request to the server. The server responds with their certificate. It would still have all the same SAN and signature from the CA and all that contained within the certificate, but for the purposes of the slide, the public key of the certificate is really all we care about. The client will then randomly generate a number that's suitable for use as an AES in symmetric encryption key. They'll encrypt that symmetric key using the server's public key. They'll send that encrypted uh, symmetric key over to the server. The server will then use their private key to decrypt that to get the symmetric key back out. At this point, we've done the key exchange. Both the client and the server have access to the same secret key. The server could then use that symmetric key with AES to encrypt a message and send that message back over to the, the client, and the client can 
use that key to decrypt the message as well. So it seems like this gives us that best of both worlds where we kind of have that slow upfront cost of RSA, but we're just encrypting a tiny bit of data uh, with authentication. And this, then we can use a, the quick AES algorithm in order to send messages back and forth. However, there's a problem with this approach. We haven't yet achieved perfect forward secrecy. So what does this mean? Uh, to explain perfect forward secrecy, we're going to review what happens when you leak your private key. So recall that, let's say an attacker gets access to the server, they grab the private key. When a client then encrypts the symmetric key using the server's public key, an attacker can intercept that. They can decrypt that symmetric key using the server's private key. And when a user sends a message that's been encrypted with the symmetric key, the attacker can intercept that, they can decrypt it with a symmetric key, read the user's messages. So when a public key is leaked, all your messages going forward, all future TLS conversations after the leak are potentially compromised. The problem with the approach we've just outlined is that if an attacker has been listening on the connection for some length of time and they've been recording these past encrypted messages, they can now use that same private key to decrypt all these old conversations uh, so from the beginning, let's say when you first generated your private key, an attacker has been listening to all the messages you've sent. When you leak that key, they can now read all the messages up to when you first generated that private key. And this is not desirable. So perfect forward secrecy is even if you leak your private key, any past conversations can't be decrypted using that private key. Only conversations going forward can be decrypted. To understand how we might achieve perfect forward secrecy, we can look back at the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm we covered earlier. And it turns out Diffie-Hellman does have perfect forward secrecy. Since these private key components, these secret colors, are randomly generated on each new conversation, there's really nothing to leak. If an attacker were to be able to intercept that on the fly, they might be able to decrypt that one message, but then the next message that's sent, the key is totally gone or regenerated anew. Let's do kind of a pros and cons with Diffie-Hellman as a key exchange algorithm versus RSA. So Diffie-Hellman, we exchange a random key on every iteration, which in turn gives us perfect forward secrecy. But the main sticking point was there's no authentication built into Diffie-Hellman. So you can't know that the server is who they say they are. With RSA, we can exchange arbitrary data, which is nice, which we can use to encrypt a symmetric key. It does provide authentication, but there's no perfect forward secrecy as we have with Diffie-Hellman. If your private key is leaked, all past messages can also be decrypted with that private key. So again, how can we kind of get the best of both worlds here? And it turns out there is an algorithm to do this called ephemeral Diffie-Hellman with RSA. You'll see this sometimes ab abbreviated as DHE or DHE underscore RSA starts similarly to RSA, where the client asks for a certificate from the server. The server returns its certificate with all the fields we saw earlier. But then it's going to start kicking off the Diffie-Hellman process in parallel, where it'll, the server will generate a private color. It'll generate a shared common color. It'll mix its private color with its public color to get this orange. And then to ensure that these colors haven't been tampered with as a, they get transmitted over the wire, the server will sign these, will generate a signature of these two colors using its RSA private key. And then the server will send this whole group of stuff over to the client. The client will go through those normal RSA progressions, checking that the SAN matches the hostname they requested, checking that the certificate hasn't been expired, looking up the CAs public key in their, uh, installed in their system to read the signature, check that all the, uh, the, the hash contained within here matches the hash of all the other fields within the certificate. So at this point, we trust that the server is who they say they are. We'll then take the server's public key. We'll use that to read this signature and check that the value contained within matches the other two colors we were sent. The client can then start the Diffie-Hellman process where they generate their own secret color. They'll mix the shared color with their secret color to get this purple. At this point we can kind of clear away the rest of this stuff and the client can then send the their shared mixture over to the server. 
At this point, the client and the server can combine those two colors to get their shared symmetric key. So at the point, we have got that best of both worlds where we have the authentication from RSA, but the ephemeral keys from Diffie-Hellman that give us that perfect forward secrecy. So if the pri server's private key were leaked in this setup, because the symmetric key is derived from these ephemeral Diffie-Hellman params, the attacker in the middle would not be able to decrypt any past conversations. So this seems like a nice improvement. However, there's another type of attack we are still unprotected against, and this is called a replay attack. In a replay attack, let's say the client is wanting to send a payment to their bank to deduct some money from their account and send it to someone else. The client encrypts that message with TLS, sends that message across. The bank then deducts that money from their account. Everything's going as expected so far. However, this attacker in the middle, let's say they've been listening to this conversation, they've been saving a copy of these encrypted messages, they can't read the encrypted message, but they can resend or replay that encrypted message, sending it back to the server again, as if it came from the client a second time. And with this, the server will just keep deducting money from the account each time this attacker sends another encrypted message. So obviously this isn't desirable. To help protect against replay attacks, we'll introduce what's called the HMAC or hash-based message authentication code. In HMAC, you can think of it as kind of a secure hash algorithm. It takes a some secret key, maybe it's that symmetric key or something similar to that, and it takes the message you want to generate a hash for. You feed both of these into the HMAC function, and it produces something that should look familiar as a SHA-256 output or whatever hashing algorithm you've negotiated as part of the TLS conversation. Let's dive into this algorithm a little bit. We'll take our super secret key, we'll exclusive or it with some constant that's just defined in the HMAC spec to get what's called the inner padding value. We'll then take that same super secret key, exclusive or that with another constant that's defined in the spec to get the outer padding value. We'll then take that inner padding, prepend it to the message that we want to generate the hash for. We'll then feed that into a hash algorithm like SHA-256. We'll then take the outer padding value, prepend that onto the value we just pulled out of the uh, SHA function. We'll feed this whole thing back into the hash function again, and this will get our final HMAC digest. And it's not immediately obvious what this buys you over just the traditional MAC, taking this original message, putting the secret key on the front of it, and putting it into the SHA function. To understand how the normal hash algorithm is vulnerable to this length extension attack, we'll quickly review the internals of how the hash algorithm works. It starts with the first plain text block. We'll feed that into the hash algorithm with our internal state set to some amount of constants that are defined in the SHA spec. Our little hash wizard will perform some bit shifting operations, do 64 rounds of that, and write the state back into, uh, write the output back into our new internal state for the next round. We'll then take our second plain text block, combine that with our new internal state, run that through. We'll get another version of the state, and finally we'll feed our last plain text block in with this internal state to get our final digest, which we'll build up by just concatenating these bits together. Now, where the length extension part comes in, the attacker can set up their internal state to this final hash value, they can then feed in an extra block on the end, feed that to the hash algorithm to get this maliciously modified hash algorithm out of the other end. So the weakness in this construction is that an attacker can tack a little bit of data onto the end of your string, and even though they don't know any of these original plain text blocks, uh, they can tack a bit of data on the end and generate a valid hash for it. So the way we've constructed HMAC where it does this inner and outer padding dance, uh, this is designed to prevent this sort of length extension attack against the normal hash algorithm. Encrypt then MAC scheme, we wouldn't even have to decrypt a message in order to read the MAC digest and check that the message hasn't been modified, where in this scheme that TLS uses, we'll have to 
decrypt the message, then read the Mac. So if a client found some vulnerability in the decryption process, the Mac wouldn't help us detect that ahead of time. Uh, other researchers argue that this Mac then encrypt scheme is easier to implement and would just cause less bugs overall. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot of good posts on the cryptography stack exchange website. Let's see how we can use the HMAC function to prevent these replay attacks. So as our secret key, we'll use what's called the Mac write key. And we'll talk about how this is generated a little later on. For now, we'll just say it's a shared secret key between the client and the server, but the attacker wouldn't have access to this. We'll then have the sequence number. And the sequence number is just an incrementing integer that anytime the client or the server sends or receives a message, they'll increment this number by one in memory. And this will allow us to detect replay attacks so for example, if the server receives a message with a lower sequence number than what's currently set in its memory, it'll be able to raise an error and say, oh, I've already received a message with that sequence number. We'll concatenate that together with a bit of metadata like the TLS type and version, as well as the unencrypted message length and the unencrypted message content. In addition to helping us prevent replay attacks, HMAC also helps us ensure message integrity. So if an attacker tried to modify the message contents or they tried to do some sort of length extension to uh, add a little bit onto the end of the message, this HMAC construct will help us detect that modification as well. So we'll concatenate these four fields together, we'll feed it in with the MAC write key, and we'll get out the HMAC digest. Now let's step through preventing a replay attack in this client and server example where the client is trying to submit a bank payment. The client will start by having their unencrypted message contents. They'll take the HMAC value of that and then they'll encrypt the entire unencrypted message along with the HMAC value. They'll then send this message across to the server. The server will use the symmetric key to decrypt this message. They'll then check the HMAC value to make sure the message hasn't been modified and that the sequence number looks correct. If everything looks good, they'll deduct the message from that person's account. If the attacker then tries to resend that message, the server will decrypt it, perform the HMAC check. It'll see, oh, I've already seen that sequence number. I'm not going to process this message or deduct any money from the user's account. So this is a way HMAC helps us detect and prevent these replay attacks. In addition to helping us detect replay attacks and detect message modifications, HMAC is also used as a building block for another construction in TLS called the pseudo-random function, or PRF. And the PRF is used as a generator of shared secrets of an arbitrary length, and we'll see how that's used a little bit later on. As input, it takes some master shared secret, a label, and a seed. Under the covers, it does use HMAC, and we can see that it does several rounds of HMAC. If you want to generate a longer output string from the PRF, you can just do more rounds and concatenate the outputs together. And we also see that each round is recursive in nature, meaning the input data for a given round depends on the output data from the round before it. And if we draw this out, it ends up looking kind of like the Cypher blockchaining example we looked at earlier. So we start with our super secret key and we'll also take a label and a seed. So in this case, our label is master secret and our seed is a random value generated by the server. We'll feed those two into the HMAC function and get our first block of uh, HMAC digest. We'll then take that output value combine it with the super secret key again, feed it into the HMAC and we'll get another block of output if we just needed 512 bits of output from this PRF, we would just concatenate these two together. If we needed a longer output, we would run another round, concatenate that on. And if we needed an output value that wasn't evenly divisible by 256, you can just truncate the last block of data. There's one more concept I want to introduce before we get to our step-by-step -step walkthrough of the TLS workflow. So far, we've said the big part of TLS is this authentication where the client has the ability to ask the server, can you prove to me you're the server I'm trying to talk to and not some attacker, and the server is able to hand back a certificate that's signed by a CA. And this is really nice mechanism for authentication, and it's such a nice mechanism that what if it worked in the other direction as well? 
where the server could ask the client, prove to me that you're one of my authorized clients and not some attacker, and the user could provide a certificate of their own that says, yes, I'm a trusted client that's been issued by a trusted CA. This process of doing authentication for clients as well as servers with TLS is called mutual TLS or mTLS. And it's usually used between components of a distributed system rather than a human from their laptop uh, for reasons we'll talk about in a second. So let's say we have a router component and an API server within our data center. We'll have a self-signed certificate authority that will issue a certificate to our server signed with their public key. This certificate authority will make sure their public key for their certificate authority gets installed on the uh, client machine. We could then have another CA. It could be the same CA, but uh, for illustration purposes, let's say this is another CA that's in charge of issuing client certificates. They'll issue a client certificate, and they'll make sure that the public key for this CA gets installed on the server-side machines. Now, when we want to initiate a mutual TLS conversation between the router and the API server, the router will begin by asking the server for its certificate. The server will respond with its certificate, which contains the SAN field and the signature from the CA and all that, as well as a request for the client to send back their certificate as well. The router will begin by checking that the SAN matched the hostname they requested, the expiration date. It'll check that it was issued and signed by the CA's uh, public key that was shown down in the bottom left. It, once they decide that they trust the server, the router will send their client certificate over to the server. The server will then check that the client certificate was issued by the CA that was installed in their system, and if everything checks out, both sides trust each other and the TLS conversation will continue. Now, I mentioned that it's mostly just between different machines in the same distributed system rather than a human using this, and let's uh, quickly go through the pros and cons of using MTLS versus a more traditional authentication mechanism like a username and password. So the plus sides of MTLS, secrets are never shared over the network. You're just sending your public key across, which is public knowledge. Your private key never leaves your machine. So this is a really nice improvement over passwords where you have to send your password to the server in order to perform authentication. If something goes wrong and an attacker is able to intercept that message and decrypt it, your secret's now leaked where this problem is uh, avoided with MTLS. You don't need to update the server in order to rotate the client certificate. So if you had to rotate a password for a user, you would have to, let's say, update some server-side database, as well as telling the client to start using a new password. And MTLS, all, as long as the same CA is issuing the client certificate, you can just issue a new client certificate, and you don't have to update the server at all. It'll just keep trusting that same CA. Uh, at some point, you will have to rotate the CA, but typically you can leave CA certificates with a much longer expiration time than you do server certificates. But the problem with MTLS is that, as we saw earlier, certificates are these really long random strings, and it would be impossible for a person to type that from memory. If technology gets to the point where everybody's using something like a password manager rather than typing in passwords from memory, this maybe becomes using certificates for authentication maybe becomes more of an option for normal websites. Um, you also, if you have some sort of a two-factor authentication device, like a little uh, key on your keychain that you plug into a USB port in order to log in, it's possible that a certificate might be part of that authentication mechanism. All right, at this point we should have all the concepts introduced to understand the TLS protocol from start to finish, so let's walk through it step by step. Recall that TLS is built on top of TCP. So TCP is going to be responsible for retransmitting packets if they get dropped or making sure the packets arrive in the right order, things like that. So the first couple messages of a TLS handshake are actually the TCP handshake. So in TCP, the client starts off a connection by sending a syn or synchronized packet to the server. The server receives that. They respond with a synchronized packet of their own, as well as an ACK or acknowledgement. The client receives the SYN ACK message, responds with one final acknowledgement of its own. 
the server receives that message. And at this point, the TCP connection is established. So every, although it's not listed in the slides, every message from here on out will be wrapped in a TCP packet that has its own sequence number and things like that. Next, we have the client and server hello messages. The client hello message will contain a list of strings that look something like this. And these are called cipher suites. A TLS supports many different kinds of algorithms. We've discussed one of those so far. So we can we recognize the TLS prefix. The Diffie-Hellman ephemeral RSA is the key exchange algorithm that will be used. It'll say with and then AES-128. This is the bulk encryption or symmetric encryption algorithm that will be used for the rest of the conversation. Uh, we also will use this with CBC or cipher block chaining in order to prevent known plain text attacks. And finally, we'll say what hash algorithm we want to use in constructions like HMAC, in this case, SHA-256. And the client will normally support a large number of these different algorithms. So for example, in the second one, it supports a slightly different key size and a slightly an alternative to CBC called GCM, as well as the same hash algorithm. And this could be a very long list depending on how many cipher suites the client understands. It'll send this big list of supported cipher suites to the server along with a single random value that will come into play later. This is called the client random value. It'll send these to the server. The server will then scan through this list of supported cipher suites. It'll pick the one that the server thinks is most appropriate. So again, for example, if the server is running a website that favors snappier page loads, it might pick a smaller key size. If it's running a bank website, it might pick a larger key size, things like that. It'll select one of those and send that in a response. It send that choice in a response back to the client along with a server random value. So this is another random value, but generated independently from the client random value. The client will receive that message and the rest of the conversation, each side knows which algorithm to use in each step of the process. In the previous slide, we selected Diffie-Hellman ephemeral RSA as our key exchange algorithm. So that's what we'll show here. The server will start by sending its certificate to the client. The server will then start computing its half of the Diffie-Hellman parameters, generating a secret color as well as a shared public color. It'll then mix those together and it'll also generate a signature of those colors using its RSA private key to ensure that these colors aren't modified in transit. It'll send those parameters over to the client as well. If we're opting into MTLS, the server would also send a client certificate request message at this time. And finally, the server will send a done message saying, I'm done sending you my key exchange messages. So over on the left here, the client has a lot going on and needs to start working through these parameters. Uh, if the client made a request to catsarecool.com, it would check that that host name is contained within the sand field. If it is, we'll check that off. We'll check that the certificate isn't expired. We'll then see that the certificate was issued by Charlie the CA. We'll look for Charlie's public key inside our laptop's SSL store. We'll use that to read the signature. We'll then concatenate together all the other fields in the certificate and take a hash of it and make sure it matches the hash within this certificate. At this point, we're pretty sure we trust the server. We'll then send our client certificate over to the server. Then the client will start working through these Diffie-Hellman parameters. We'll now use the server's public key to read the signature and check that the value within matches the other Diffie-Hellman parameters we were sent in plain text. The client will then generate a secret color of its own. It'll mix that color with the common red color that the server sent over. Now we can get this stuff out of the way. The client will now send the purple mixture over to the server. At this point, the client has enough to generate the shared symmetric key that'll be used in the next step of the process. To prove that the client owns the private key that corresponds with this client certificate, the client is going to send a certificate verify message. To do that, the client will take all the handshake messages that have been sent so far in the conversation, concatenate them all together, 
take a SHA-256 hash of that and then use the private key from this client certificate to create a signature of the, that hash. We'll then send this signature over to the server. At this point, the server can first wants to check that this client certificate was issued by a CA that it knows about. So it'll check the uh, CA certificate signature is issued by a public key that's in its cert store. If so, we'll check that off. We'll then use the certificate's public, the client certificate's public key to read the signature. The server will then concatenate all the messages it sent and received as part of this process, take the hash of that. If the hash values match, we'll check that off. It does seem like the client owns the private key that corresponds with this certificate. Finally, the server will then mix together these two values to arrive at the same symmetric secret key. So at this point, the key exchange algorithm is complete and we can start encrypting our data. The final step before we can start encrypting the user's application data is the to exchange finished messages. So in the finished message, we'll take that shared symmetric key we just computed with the key exchange algorithm. And here we'll call this the pre-master secret. We'll then combine that with the master secret label and the client random and server random values we exchanged in the hello messages and we'll feed that into the PRF algorithm. The client or the server will do the same thing using the same label and the same pre-master secret as well as the two random values. This will now result in our master key. You may ask why this was necessary, why we couldn't just use the pre-master secret as the shared secret key and since TLS supports so many different key exchange algorithms, they all output a secret in a slightly different format. So running everything through the same PRF ensures a common format for the master encryption key we have here. The client will then send a change cipher spec message, and this informs the server that the client is going to start encrypting things with that master key. We're going to do one other run through the PRF using now our master key, the client finished label, and similar to the client certificate verify message, we're going to concatenate together all the messages we've sent and received so far, take the hash of that and feed that in as well. And this is just to ensure that no handshake messages have been lost or modified as part of this conversation. We'll put that PRF value in our finished message, send that across, The server will similarly send, start sending a change cipher spec message to the client. We'll then do the same calculation with the label server finished rather than client finished. Feed that into the PRF. It'll then put this PRF message into a finished message. Send that across. Finally, each side will recompute the same PRF output that the other side computed. So for example, the client over here will compute the PRF value using the server finished label. The server will use the client finished label. They'll check that the value they just computed matches the value they received from the other side. If everything matches up, we're ready to start encrypting our application data. Up to this point, all of these message, messages have just been TLS handshake messages trying to set up the secure connection. At this point, this is where your application's data would start getting encrypted. So for example, if you were making an HTTPS connection, this is where your headers and your path and those HTTP specific fields would start getting encrypted and passed along. So to encrypt application data, we'll start with the master secret. We'll use the label key expansion and our random server and client random values as seeds. We'll feed that into the PRF, and this will give us a block of data 128 bytes long. We'll now carve this up into four separate fields, the client write Mac, the server write Mac, the client write key, and the server write key. And we'll use these as individual secrets for the subsequent steps in the process. Again, you might ask why we couldn't just use the master secret to encrypt every bit of data we send along. It turns out that by reusing secrets, 
for different parts of the process, you're giving an attacker more hints as to what that secret might be. So it's better to take the master key, derive four individual secrets from it, and use those individual secrets for each step in the process. The server will perform the same calculation and get the exact same four values. The client will then needs to compute the HMAC value in order to protect the integrity of their message. So they'll take the client write MAC secret key, they'll create add the sequence number, which is just one in this case because this is the first message we sent. They'll add some bit of metadata like the TLS type and version, the unencrypted message length, and finally their unencrypted message that they want to send across, in which case this is hello world. They'll feed all of this into the HMAC function and get the MAC digest of their message. The client will then take their client write key, their unencrypted hello world message, append on the MAC digest, as well as some padding to make this the total size of this evenly divisible by the block size of our symmetric encryption algorithm. Let's say in this case we're using AES-128, This the length of this would have to be divisible by 128. And we're going to generate a random initialization vector and feed all this into our AES encryption function. We then take this encrypted AES value and we'll tack on the initialization vector we just generated. Again, it's totally fine to publicly share the initialization vector. It just needs to be randomly generated for each message, but sharing it publicly doesn't hurt anything. We send this over to the server. The server is going to take that same client write key. They're going to use this run the AES function in reverse to decrypt this message, also passing it that same initialization vector. They'll get back the decrypted string, which has a plain text message at the front, the MAC digest, and the padding. They'll begin by verifying the padding. So the last byte of this is the length of the padding, and each previous padding byte is the length of the padding encoded into binary. So again, if the length of padding was 11 bytes, the last byte would be the number 11 in binary, and each block of padding prior to that would be the number 11 in binary as well. So we need. it's important that the server check that that padding hasn't been modified and is the correct length. If so, we'll take that away. We now need to verify the MAC digest. To do that, the server is going to perform the same calculation. It'll say, okay, this is the first message I've received, so the secret number is 1, same, same TLS type and version. It'll put the same unencrypted method length and the plain text message that was the front of this string we were just looking at. They'll take the client write MAC and feed that into the HMAC function. If this equals what was included in the HMAC value the client sent over, we know the message hasn't been modified. And at this point, the client has successfully sent a secure message to the server without the attacker in the middle being able to read the message or modify the message without either the server or the client knowing about it. So we would keep sending messages back and forth until the client or the server was done sending messages. At this point, the one side will send what's called a closed notify message. This is just a small message that says, hey, server, I'm done sending you any more messages. Feel free to close the connection. The server acknowledges this by sending a closed notify of its own, saying, all right, let's close down the connection. At this point, the connection shuts down, and the TLS conversation has come to a close. Next, we're going to talk about some previous attacks and vulnerabilities that have taken place against TLS. The first one we're going to talk about is called Freak, or Factoring RSA Export Keys. This attack was discovered in 2015, but the flaw had been present in many previous TLS and SSL versions. So in the handshake message, the client starts by sending the list of cipher suites they support to the server. And as part of this attack, the attacker intercepts this initial message it replaces the list of cipher suites, which might contain some very strong ciphers that the attacker doesn't know how to break. And it'll pick the oldest, most insecure cipher in that list and send just that cipher along to the server. 
since the server now just has one cipher to pick from, the rest of the TLS conversation will continue with this older, more insecure cipher rather than the stronger ciphers that the client supported. And this is what's known as a protocol downgrade attack. And what makes this possible is TLS versions 1.0 and earlier in that final finish message, rather than concatenating together all the handshake -like messages that have been sent and received so far, the finish message just contained the hash of the secret key. So modifications like this to those early handshake messages weren't detectable. But TLS 1.1 and 1.2 uh, don't have this flaw because they can include the hash of all those messages. So the way to mitigate this attack is to update your clients and servers to not support these super old and secure cipher suites any longer. Next, we're going to discuss the Beast or Browse Exploit against SSL and TLS attack from 2011. And the phrase Browser Exploit here means that this attack requires the attacker to be able to take control of the user's browser. So for example, injecting arbitrary JavaScript, or in the a case of this attack, the authors published a Java applet that took advantage of some browser security holes around running Java applets in the browser. And what I have pictured here is the AES decryption step with Cypher block chaining. And you'll recall from earlier that this initialization vector is randomly generated on each message you want to send and then send along to the server as plain text. But this is only true for a TLS 1.1 and later. In earlier versions of SSL and TLS, this initialization vector was randomly generated on the very first run, but on subsequent runs, the last ciphertext block from the previous run was used as the initialization vector for the next AES computation. And this is what this property is what this attack relies on. So the attacker would like to see if they can guess one of these plain text blocks in a known plain text attack. And the data they have access to is all these ciphertext blocks. But the key thing here is that they know what the next initialization vector is going to be as a result of this flaw in the TLS design. So the attacker knows that the upcoming IV is the last ciphertext block from the previous computation. They're going to take control of the user's browser. They're going to take the upcoming initialization vector, the previous initialization vector from the last AES run, and their plain text guess to try to see if they can guess the first block of plain text that was decrypted in the previous run. They're going to exclusive or all those together and pass those into the AES function. And that will tell them whether they've guessed this first plain text block correctly. So let's try to make some sense of this. So exclusive or, if you exclusive or the same value twice in a row, it just cancels itself out. So for example here, we have this upcoming IV, we exclusive OR it, and then we exclusive OR the upcoming IV again. This cancels out so that this exclusive OR and this exclusive OR uh, are ignored. We now just have the previous IV exclusive OR with this plain text guess. And these are the same two inputs that were passed into the previous decryption step for the first plain text block. So since we're feeding in the same output, we or the same input, we should get the same output. And if our output matches the first ciphertext block from the previous run, that means we've guessed the plain text correctly, and we know that the we've guessed the user's first message that's been sent. So the way to mitigate the, this is to update to a version greater than TLS 1.1 and update your browser so that those vulnerabilities in the Java applet or executing arbitrary JavaScript are fixed. The next attack we're going to look at is the Poodle attack from 2014, or padding Oracle on downgraded legacy encryption. And this is another browser exploit attack, which means the attacker has to be able to run arbitrary code in the user's browser in order to perform this attack. And this phrase, downgraded legacy encryption, this means that this attack is meant to be combined with another protocol downgrade attack like Freak that we saw earlier in order to force the client and the server to fall back to SSL 3.0 or earlier. And at a high level, what this attack does is it the attacker forces the user's browser to encrypt a secret value to send to the server. So for example, a, a cookie um, that should be kept secret. And then the attacker will force the user's browser to decrypt that ciphertext it just sent 
and it'll use this clever trick around a padding flaw in SSL 3.0 to decrypt that secret value one byte at a time. So what we have pictured here is the AES decryption step. We have this ciphertext up at the top, which the attacker has set up to contain a secret value like a cookie. And the, we're relying on a flaw in a SSL 3.0 around this padding value here. Uh, in later versions of TLS, this padding value has a very specific format where you take the length of the padding, which is the last byte, you encode that into binary. So in this case, it, we would generate the binary string of 120, and then for every byte of padding, we would repeat that 120 string over and over again. And versions SSL 3.0 and earlier, the padding bytes were all random, and only that last length byte was checked for validity. And that's what this attack relies on. So in order to perform this attack, the again, the attacker will force the user's browser to encrypt a secret value. It'll then take the ciphertext and ask the user's browser to decrypt it. And they're trying to guess this last byte of the plain text block that came just before this padding block. And the stack is easiest when the entire last block is padding. And the authors of this have some clever tricks in order to ensure that the byte you're trying to guess occurs exactly on that boundary. To do this, the attacker will take this second ciphertext block and they'll copy it into the third position. They'll then ask the user's browser to attempt to decrypt this block. And normally what will happen is there'll be a padding error because the last decrypted byte here didn't happen to equal 120. So the user's browser will check that and say padding error. However, you have just a random, if you repeat this process from the beginning, each time you have a 1 out of 256 chance that by you know random chance this last number will be correct. And if that's the case, the browser won't throw a padding error. And at that point, you know that this the decrypted value contained 120 in this position. So how can we use that information in order to get this last byte of the preceding block? Well, we know since the browser didn't raise an error that after running this second ciphertext block through the AES function and exclusive oring that with the second ciphertext block, we know that the last byte of that value is 120. Oh, we can also rely on the fact that uh, SS, the exclusive or is commutative, meaning the this decrypted value exclusive or with C2 is equal to 120. We can flip that around and say that 120 exclusive or with C2 is equal to this decrypted value. And if we look over here on the left-hand side to guess this first plain text block, this was generated from taking this first ciphertext block, exclusive oring it with this decrypted value from C2 to get this first plain text block. And we now know that the decrypted value of C2 is equal to C2 exclusive or 120. So we can just drop that down. And if we compute this value, we now know the last byte of P2. And so in doing this, if you keep repeating this attack over and over again, you can, once you get one, once you guess the last byte, you can do some clever tricks to slide the value you want to guess over by one byte, run it again to guess the next to the last byte, and so on until you decrypt the whole uh, secret you're trying to get at, like the session cookie. The next two attacks we're going to touch on just briefly are the crime attack and breach attack. Crime stands for compression ratio info leak made easy, and breach stands for browser reconnaissance and exfiltration via adaptive compression of hypertext. Each uh, SSL, it's tradition now that each attack against SSL and TLS has one of these cutesy acronyms, and the same group discovered these in 2012 and 2013, respectively. And we haven't talked about this feature of TLS, but the TLS spec does allow you to perform automatic compression of your data in order to save on bandwidth costs. But it turns out that this isn't all that great in practice. Since it's streaming compression, there's a limit to how much compression it can do on the fly. And you tend to get better results if you do compression at the application layer. For example, taking a whole JavaScript file, minifying it, gzipping it, will get you much better performance and much better compression results than allowing the TLS streaming cipher. We haven't discussed the implementation of how this works, but because it's not that useful in practice and because it has several of these security vulnerabilities that have resulted over the years, 
most browsers have just totally disabled TLS compression as an option and many servers have this turned off by default. So we're not going to dig into the details here, just have this feature turned off in your client and servers if possible. The final attack we're going to talk about is Heartbleed from 2014. This was a scary one. So the name here comes from a TLS extension called Heartbeat. And this extension was intended to keep idle connections open longer by allowing clients and servers to periodically send little heartbeat messages that says, hey, I'm still here, keep the connection open, even though I'm not sending you any more encrypted data for the moment. So in this extension, a user would send a heartbeat message to keep the connection open, they would send a given string, in this case OK, and they would say the length of that string, in this case two bytes long, and they would expect the server to receive that message and send the same string back to them that says, hey, I'm here too, I agree to keep the connection open. And the flaw in some SSL and TLS implementations was an attacker could send a heartbeat message and they could send the same string OK, but rather than sending the correct length of two bytes, they could say, oh, it's actually 64 kilobytes long. And when a server with a faulty implementation would receive this, it would buffer overflow and start reading into its memory. And sometimes that would just be random nonsense, but sometimes that might be a very sensitive value like the server's private key, maybe it's the admin password for the machine or the database, maybe it's uh, passwords for users that were being worked on with that machine, and it would take this whole string and send it back to the attacker in plain text. And this is a very scary attack because you didn't have to do any of the so, sort of browser exploit attacks, you didn't have to man in the middle of the user, you could just connect to any random server, start sending these heartbeat messages that were very easy to craft, and the server would just start handing you all this unencrypted stuff that was stored in memory. So after this attack happened, you probably got a lot of messages from all the websites you use saying you need to reset your password right now, and this was as a result of this heartbleed attack. So. This wasn't a flaw in TLS per se, this was just a common mistake in the implementation, but because this attack was so easy to carry out, this was a, a very scary security vulnerability for a while. Finally, we're going to close out with some tips for using TLS correctly and some common gotchas or mistakes that can bite you when using TLS. Let's look at some common errors you might encounter in setting up TLS in your applications and some ways to mitigate those. So you might see certificate signed by unknown authority. This is most common when you're using a self-signed certificate authority to issue certificates, but the CA's public key didn't get installed correctly on the machine you're running this command from. So ensure that the CA certificate used to issue those server certificates is installed correctly in your machines, either the browser or in your operating system's SSL directory. You might see no alternative certificate subject name matches. So let's say you tried to make a request to catsorcool.com. You were able to reach the server, but the certificate the server handed back did not include this, the host name in its SAN field. So double check that the server certificate was requested with the SAN field containing the host name you're trying to talk to. And this can also come up if you're trying to uh, make an HTTPS connection to a machine based on an IP address, but its IP address isn't contained within the SAN field, only the DNS host name is. So either make sure you're always making a request using the DNS host name, or if you want, you can get the certificate issued with a static IP address in the SAN field as well as the host name. And finally, remember that the common name is deprecated by some browser and HTTPS clients. So make sure that the host name you're trying to talk to is in the SAN field and not in the, just in the common name field. You might also see certificate is expired or not yet valid. This normally just means the certificate has reached its expiration date and you need to get a new one requested issued by your CA. We also, the second half or not yet valid is normally not a problem, but I have seen this once due to clock drift. So we had a component in a distributed system that was issuing client certificates on the fly and 
we started getting this uh, certificate expired and not yet valid error when the API server was rejecting these client certificates. And it turned out the API server's clock was five seconds behind what the client's clock was. And this was causing the server to see the certificates as having an update in the future, causing this error. So that was a fun little gotcha. Another issue you might see when rolling out TLS for the first time is that performance really degrades once you roll it out. And a way to mitigate this is to use TCP keep alives and TLS session resumption. TCP keep alives are a way to avoid opening a new TCP connection whenever a new HTTPS connection comes in. TCP keep alives allow the client and the server to keep a TCP connection open and use it for multiple HTTPS requests rather than closing it after each request finishes. And this allows you to avoid some of those TCP handshake messages at the start of the connection. Similarly, TLS session resumption, we didn't talk about, but as part of your client hello message, you can include a previous session ID that tells the server, hey, let's pick up where we left off and reuse those negotiated key exchange parameters from the previous time we connected rather than redoing all that negotiation. And this allows you to skip a lot of those handshake messages we looked at earlier. However, there is a gotcha to this gotcha when using TCP keep alives. Let's say you have a API server that's sitting behind a load balancer. The IaaS load balancers are very picky with about when that API server closes these TCP connections or TCP keep alive connections. For example, on AWS, if the backend API server closes the TCP connection before 60 seconds have elapsed, the AWS load balancer will still try to reuse that connection and it'll get some sort of a connection reset by peer or similar error. So you want your server on AWS at least to set that timeout to greater than 60 seconds. However, on Azure, the reverse is true where we got better results by having the API server close the connection earlier than the load balancer's timeout of 240 seconds. And on GCP, it's a little of both where timing out, if you're using an HTTPS load balancer, setting the timeout to something higher than 600 seconds avoided some strange TCP errors. Whereas when we used a TCP load balancer, we had to set it less than 600 seconds. So if you roll out TLS with keep alives and you start getting some weird TCP connection errors intermittently, you might check that your values agree with the one shown here. You might also run into problems where you forgot to renew the certificate and now all of a sudden all of your users are complaining that the site is displaying this scary warning when they try to visit it. And this is one of those things where you just have to put processes and automation in place from the very beginning around renewing these certificates. Uh, I kind of think that setting a shorter expiration time can actually help here, where it's a somewhat routine process that you have to do every couple months, whereas if you set the expiration to three years in the future, um, there's an increased chance that whoever was responsible for renewing that certificate has left the company or something like that. And you might hear complaint that TLS is, TLS is still vulnerable, like we listed all these previous attacks that have occurred against TLS. How can we ensure that TLS is really keeping us safe? Uh, one way to do this is to ensure that your clients and servers stay up to date so that if there are any vulnerabilities discovered in the TLS implementation that you're getting those fixes for those vulnerabilities. Configure your servers to require strong Cypher suites if possible. This isn't always possible if you have to uh, support really old client machines that haven't been updated in a very long time, but if if possible, definitely drop support on the server side for older, weaker Cypher suites. You want to use some sort of a Cypher that enforces forward secrecy, for example, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman like we talked about earlier. This ensures that if your server's private key is leaked, that previously sent messages can't be decrypted. Consider using OCSP stapling. Um, like we talked about earlier, there are some trade-offs here where if the CAs website goes down, you might not be able to get that stapled value. So there is some availability concerns here, but if you can, if you're okay with the availability guarantees your CA server is providing, this can be a really nice way to ensure that if your private key is leaked, you can revoke your certificate and clients will recognize and respect that revocation. And finally, 
the, one of the best ways to protect your application is ensuring that all connections take place over HTTPS and none of them use the plain text HTTP protocol. You can do this by just totally disabling HTTP on the server or enabling a feature called strict transport security or HSTS, which will make it so any HTTP links are automatically rewritten to HTTPS. And one last concept we're going to talk about is called TLS termination. And recall from our earlier example that we are sending, when we send this packet out over the internet, it goes to all these different machines and finally arrives at the server. And even this is a bit of an oversimplification. What is more common is you have the client there making a request that goes through all these machines out over the internet it gets to some sort of a load balancer and that load balancer is maybe sitting in front of a couple API servers in your data center and maybe those API servers talk to a database as well as some sort of a logging system. So what we discussed so far was mostly concerned with making sure this first leg where your request goes over the internet is encrypted using TLS but oftentimes users or system administrators, since they own all the machines in this data center, they control all the hardware, they might opt for just using plain HTTP once it gets into the data center. In this setup, you would say TLS is being terminated at the load balancer, meaning the initial request to the load balancer is encrypted using TLS, but then the load balancer will terminate that connection and open a new connection to the backend servers and forward that traffic unencrypted. And this it results in some performance gains because you don't need to do any of that computationally heavy TLS math and it avoids some configuration gotchas where you don't have to make sure that certificates are configured exactly right on all these individual machines. However, as more workloads move out of privately owned data centers into public clouds like AWS or GCP, or you might have some sort of a hybrid cloud setup where parts of your service live out on a public cloud somewhere, more and more people are moving towards using TLS within the data center as well, and maybe even going up to mutual TLS so that both the client and server know they can trust each other. And this requires that you have certificates installed on every one of these machines. So in this setup, we would say TLS is being terminated at each individual machine rather than at the load balancer. All right, I'll say just a few more things before finally closing this out. Even though we've been talking for a couple of hours now, there's still quite a few things that we didn't get a chance to cover around TLS. For example, there are even more secure cipher suites than the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman and with AES that we talked about earlier. For example, there are some algorithms that use what are called elliptic curves, which are based on the algebraic structure of elliptic curves over finite fields. And I honestly have no idea what this means, but if that sounds interesting to you, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting information to be found there. There are lots of TLS extensions that we didn't get to cover. For example, server name identification or SNI it allows a single web server to look at the host name that a client is requesting and serve up a different certificate based on the requested host name. So that might be, extensions like this might be useful when you deploy TLS to your applications. Finally, this whole presentation, the walkthrough we did covered TLS 1.2, which is the current standard, but TLS 1.3 was just ratified in August, and you should start seeing that roll out to client and servers in the near future. It has a lot of performance improvements and really a lot of simplifications where many of those handshake messages are collapsed down and simplified to cut down on the number of messages that have to be exchanged back and forth. It drops support for a lot of older legacy cipher suites that are now found to be insecure. And the main cipher suite it uses involves authentication encryption with associated data, or AEAD, and this is a symmetric encryption algorithm with a Mac built right into it, so you don't need that separate HMAC step. Finally, there's a ton of implementation details, like little gotchas that we didn't get to cover, but the TLS uh, spec, or RFC, shares a lot of those little tips for avoiding mistakes when you're, if you happen to be coding your own TLS application, or implementation, I should say. To close this out, security is an ongoing battle to keep your users safe and secure. One small mistake in your users' personal data could be taken by attackers who want to cause them harm. 
and luckily we have security researchers who have spent decades developing concepts and ideas and algorithms like TLS in order to help us protect our users. So whenever we use TLS, we are truly standing on the shoulders of giants. So thank you, thank you, thank you security researchers for helping us keep our users safe and secure. Finally, I just want to share a few words of thanks to the people that helped me create this presentation. Most of the information here was taken from the TLS RFC or the TLS spec, which describes the protocol. And as I was reading through there, if there was ever a concept I didn't understand, the articles on Wikipedia were a great source of help in helping me understand those concepts and understand how they relate back to TLS. If I was confused about why a certain step was taken or why some alternative step wasn't taken, I would normally check the Security Stack Exchange website where the question had usually already been asked and there were a dozen different people all chiming in to come up with a really great response. So thank you to everyone who contributed to any of these uh, resources. The emojis were taken from Twitter, so Twitter has a set of open source emojis that are available at this website. Thank you to my coworker Ansi Fakori for coming up with the style of presenting which uses emojis to convey information. I think I would have had a lot more uninteresting walls of text if I didn't learn about this style of presenting. So thanks so much Ansi for coming up with this presentation style. And finally, thank you for watching. Uh, we've covered a ton of information over the past couple hours. Thanks for sticking through it with me. And I hope this information will help you build more secure applications. And I also hope you are able to teach some of this knowledge to the next person to keep this knowledge moving forward out to more people. So thanks for sticking through it with me. And that's all I've got. I won't be sending any more messages. Please close your side of the connection. Take care. <laughs>